how much tyranny you have to impose in order to produce something like equality of outcome. You, the, the, and Thomas Sowell's talked about this a little bit too. He said, you, what the people who are agitating for equality of outcome don't understand is that you have to cede so much power to the authorities, to the government, in order to ensure equality of outcome that a tyranny is inevitable. And that's right. All right, so I wanted to assess one of the most deepest and thought-provoking questions that plagues the political landscape that the right consistently keeps perpetuating. Pointing out the radical left and associating the radical left with equality of outcome. And we've heard individuals such as Dr. Peterson that we just heard, as well as Ben Shapiro, Thomas Sowell, and various other right-wing figures consistently point out that there's a radical left and that radical left is arguing for equality of outcomes, meaning in every sphere of life, let alone economically, there should be complete and utter equality. But of course, that analysis is comical at best. Because in actuality, and moreover factually, there isn't any sort of radical left that's arguing for equality of outcome. For example, I don't know which specific element that he's referring to. If he's referring to the Bernie Sanders left within the American context, arguing for equality of outcome, that analysis is utterly flawed in every sort of way imaginable. All he was arguing for was policies that already exist in all other developed nations, such as one form or another, as he's mentioned numerous times, a single pair and or Medicare for all type system. Moreover, when he's arguing in favor of other policies as well, whether legalizing marijuana from a social standpoint, higher wages such as raising the minimum wage to $15, let alone allowing workers to have bargaining rights to the, such a capacity in regards to increasing unionization, predominantly associated with job creation that he was going to push for, such as through infrastructure project and or projects. None of those policy platforms are radical in any sort of way, shape or form. Why? Because those policy initiatives already exist in all other developed nations. Therefore, by logic, if Bernie Sanders' policies were radical and or associated with the radical left, then all other developed nations would be conceptualized and understood to be radical left nations and or countries. But of course we know that's not the case. Why? Because most countries, especially Western democracies, be it Canada, UK and America, have a private sector as well as a public sector. Now Canada and the UK have much more of a vibrant and or stable public sector especially in terms of health care coverage. Meanwhile, America doesn't have even nowhere near a large and or robust public sector compared to UK and Canada. But if we go further into the analysis, the Scandinavian countries actually have a robust public sector as well as a vibrant private sector so they go even further than Western democracies such as UK and Canada that have a stable and strong and fundamental public sector but nonetheless nowhere near 
as that of the robust public sector, of course found in uh, the Scandinavian countries, such as public education is extended even past the grade 12 and or high school level. That would be one of those elements. Now, if we go further into the analysis, I can see where maybe he's pointing to some small fringe element of the radical left that could maybe be 0.5% of college students that may be freshmen and idealistic and are probably going to change their worldview by sophomore year. But of course, that would be an immensely flawed analysis on his part because 18-year-old freshman students that may be arguing for equality of outcome have absolutely no institutional power to actually enact any sort of radical left policies that are tied to equality of outcome. So therefore, I would argue that there is an actuality and moreover factually an actual radical left element in its totality. But if we want to go even deeper into the issue, now one can point out statements that Ben Shapiro's made in the past, such as referring to Kamala Harris as a radical leftist. Now, where is he getting that analysis from? Because that's the deeper question we have to raise. He's getting that analysis, and it's actually based on a factual standpoint. Why? Because if you actually assess Kamala Harris's voting record, you'll see that she voted for a lot of center-left policies, such as supporting Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All bill. But when she ran in the Democratic primaries, she, of course, changed her position. Why? Because it was politically expedient within that context to support Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All bill and also to support the Green New Deal. But when she ran in the Democratic primaries, it was no longer politically expedient for her to support such policies. Why? Because Bernie Sanders already had that left-wing element of the Democratic base. So therefore, it became politically expedient for her to distinguish herself from Bernie Sanders an appeal to more of a centrist and or moderate lane within the context of the democratic primaries. That's the analysis that Ben Shapiro doesn't give you. Because if you explicitly want to go by the voting record, yes, he's correct. But then we have to assess why is there so many contradictions found in regards to her voting record and what she stated within the context of the Democratic primaries, where she multiple times contradicted herself in regards to supporting Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All bill, let alone some of the statements she's made in the past and or present tied to taking more of a proactive approach in regards to dealing with climate change, such as her past support of the Green New Deal. So we know now that's not true as well in its totality. So now we have to go even further into the issue. Well, then who is uh, this equality of outcome largely being perpetuated by some sort of radical left element of the left? Now, one can go really deep into it and say, well, what about a lot of these corporations that are perpetuating and are pushing for this sort of diversity agenda? such as what we just recently heard from Coca-Cola that's pushing for diversity rooted in telling its workers to be less white. Now, is that tied to the radical left and or left-wing politics in its totality? No, in actuality it's not. What it is, 
is corporations engaging in tokenism, pushing for these superficial diversity programs while paying their workers with starvation wages and or immense levels of wage stagnation such as not supporting the federal minimum wage increase, let alone not allowing for their workers to have bargaining power, such as having the ability to unionize. That stuff pushed to the margins. Then what's pushed to the forefront is tokenism tied to diversity. That's what's happening within the context of the corporations. It's not that these corporations have been seized by some sort of radical left element of left-wing politics that's pushing for such said diversity programs. And even individuals like Robin DiAngelo, they're very much a part of that. That's why a lot of left tubers have been critical of her text, White Fragility. It's largely tied to corporations and corporations pushing for tokenism. It's not tied to left-wing politics. Therefore, that radical left agenda that Dr. Peterson, who even goes to the extent of saying that that radical left is pushing for Stalinism, again, don't know where and who's pushing for Stalinism within the context of the left-wing sphere at large, whether through any sort of media outlets, even on YouTube within the sort of left-tube sphere. There's not any left-tuber that's pushing for Stalinism. But nonetheless, this is the conceptualization that dumb fucks like Dr. Peterson keep pushing forward. Now, I've said this before, when it comes to Jungian psychology and or Dr. Peterson's psychological analysis, it's actually quite insightful. The problem is when he strays off that analysis and gets into politics, it's downright cringe inducing in regards to where he's coming up with a lot of these perspectives and or viewpoints that he's outlining. So therefore, I would say and or argue that the left is not arguing for equality of outcome. Instead, they're arguing for equality of opportunity, such as the Bernie Sanders left, that were pushing for merely regulating the healthcare market in light and or interest of the public good by transitioning and or dealing with a sick market such as the healthcare market that needs democratic intervention. Why? Because more than 18,000 individuals die each year because they don't have access to basic healthcare. That's a sick market that needs to transition from the private sector into the public sector which is the initiative that he stated multiple times that all other developed countries have taken. Why? Because it regulates the market and corresponds in giving individuals equal opportunity. Because a sickness that's debilitating, such as certain surgical procedures, shouldn't result in bankruptcy. But... Uh, here we have Dr. Peterson's perspective on the radical left associated with a quality of outcome. It, the, how much tyranny you have to impose in order to produce something like equality of outcome? You, the, the, and Thomas Sowell's talked about this a little bit too. He said, you know, what the people who are agitating for equality of outcome don't understand is that you have to cede so much power to the authorities, to the government, in order to ensure equality of outcome, that a tyranny is inevitable. Oh. And that's right. And the other pro another problem with equality of outcome, this is also a big technical problem, is like, well, what measure of outcome? You know, there's lots of outcomes, like, how happy are you? How much pain are you in? How healthy are you? How much money do you have? How much opportunity for movement forward do you have? 
What's the width of your social connections? Like, what's the quality of your friendships? Do you have exposure to art and literature? Like, you know, you can multiply the number of dimensions of evaluation between people innumerably, right? Because there's, there's all sorts of ways to classify people. You're going to get equality of outcome on every one of those measures? Is like everyone going to have to be equally happy in their relationship? And if not, why not? Why, why stop with economic, why stop with pay? There's no place to stop. So, and that's, and that's a huge technical problem. Because there is no place to stop, there will be no stopping. It's like nobody can have anything else, nobody can have anything that everyone else doesn't have at the same time. That's the ultimate outcome of equality of outcome. Well, you think about what that would mean. It's terrible. Well, instantly you think, oh, well, there's nothing but a tyrannical system could impose that. All right, so there we have Dr. Peterson's analysis. And again, it's very hard to determine what specific elements he's referring to when he says equality of outcome. Nobody on the left is arguing that the CEO and or the cleaner within the context of a specific company should be paid the same. The argument that at least I'm making as an individual that falls between, I would say, a liberal and a social democrat is that the cleaner shouldn't be making starvation wages. That he or she should be making enough wages that correspond in at least a living wage. That's the arguments that the left is making. Why? Because it allows for equality of opportunity.